The Lord bless you again, brethren, beloved. Welcome to another Bible study. Uh, it is absolutely awesome to greet all of you, my father's children, in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercies endureth forever. Um, given all the things that are happening in our little island home, Jamaica, um, over the past couple of days, uh, some things certainly will have some impact on the church. We nevertheless, who know the Lord, who are covered by his blood, must recognize that we have got to hold on, we have got to press, we have got to persevere. Certainly, there already are negative repercussions coming out of all that has been happening. And the name of the church has been on the forefront of the news media. But God is still God. God is in control. And the church will be the church. And I want to encourage the saints of the Most High God, in spite of what is happening, there will always be a church. And the gates of hell will fight against the church of the living God, but it will never prevail. And I believe it is extremely important to continue along the line that we were going, given what is happening and what the repercussions, the blowback that will take place as it relates to the church, I believe that we are in line with the will of the Almighty to be talking about this particular part of Revelation. When we met in Bible study the last time, uh, we did uh, outline that we were getting into Revelation, but we would not have been doing the entire book of Revelation as a book because there were things that were contained in it as you know, Revelation is one of the New Testament, one of the book of prophecies, the New Testament book that speak of prophetic things, things that are to come. As we look through Revelation, we recognize that the apostle John was given the instruction to write about the things which are and the things which will come, right? And it spoke to prophetic events that certainly will be coming up on the land. And we had taken time out earlier on to go through and to go into a lot of the things that were to come. And we therefore spent time, as we said the last time, and we looked at earlier on in the year things about the Antichrist, things about the system that will come, and we have spent enough time going through a number of the things, a number of the issues that Revelation describes. And so we will not be going back into that, but we wanted to take a particular slant, as we said um, the last time, and zoom in on the churches. Because Bible study over these few weeks will be focused, though broadly, on Revelation. We will be focusing our lenses on the seven churches. A few additional things afterwards, but in general, we want to be looking at the churches because it is in my heart to have us to be aware that we are in a powerful body. We are in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, this mystical body which he purchased with his own blood. And it is important that we recognize where we are. It is important that we recognize who we are. It is important that we recognize whose we are. And when we are in the church, it is also important that we recognize that in as much as it is the body of Jesus Christ, that mystical body, that powerful body, that body that will grow from mountain tops and valleys and Go on no matter what. It is important that we recognize that the church of the first century and the church of this era that we are in 
We are together as one, as a part of the body of Christ. There were some things then that happened in the church. There were some things then that took place in the body of Christ that is no different from things that are happening today. Have you ever heard folks talking about, I want to go back to the first church. I want things to happen today as happened in the first century apostolic church. We are going to be surprised to see some of the things, some things that we loathe today, that we fight against, that we hit out at as happening in the modern church. We are going to be surprised to see that some of these very things were happening in the first century church where the apostles themselves were. The very church that the apostles themselves planted. And we are going to find that those folks were no superhumans that lived in an era where the Holy Ghost reigned supreme to the extent that there was no sin and there was no falling away and there were no negative blowbacks and all. We are going to find that some things were there that will amaze us. But we are also going to see that they had the capacity and they had the power because they had the Holy Ghost to take heed to the warnings of Jesus Christ and make adjustments and make right so that they would be ready when the Lord Jesus comes. And as a result of what we are going to see then, we are going to realize that what we are experiencing now, it is a part of our human interactions with our environment, where we live, the, the environment, the atmosphere in which we operate as a church. And yes, there will be uh, faltering along the way, but yes, there are going to be mountaintop experiences also. Yes, we are going to get commendation, but yes, there will also be rebuke. And we do that even in church today. No different from what happened in the churches way back of yesteryear. And we are therefore going to take time as we look at Revelation. We will zoom in and focus on the churches, their impact then, what they can teach us today. And we will be amazed at what is in the book that speak to us today in the 21st century. So I want just to take us, and I'm going to very early in my um, presentation in Bible study tonight, we are going to take time this evening and we are going to look at, uh, there is a little PowerPoint presentation so that we can take our time and go through as we get into the, the details and the depth of some of the things happening in the church then and putting it together to see how it links with the church today, we will go on this journey and there is a lot to learn. I want the church of this 21st century to know that we have it inside of us and we can make it. There are times when we are going to be commended, as I said earlier on, but there are also times when we are going to be rebuked, rebuked by the Lord or rebuked by the leadership. We are going to be commended by the Lord or we are going to be commended by the leadership. Whichever way it is, it is how the church has always operated. There is never at this stage in the walk here on earth a perfect church. Never. Not here as yet. But we are striving for perfection. And we made that point some time ago. But we are going to take the time and we are going to drill in. And we are going to find some things that will encourage our hearts. I want to, at this moment, send something out to all of us that are in the church and that have a desire to serve God, a desire to make it when the Lord Jesus returns to this earth. Listen, we are in the kingdom for such a time as this. The church of Jesus Christ is the vehicle that God Almighty is using that transports humankind from this life into the other. Outside of the church of Jesus Christ, there is no other body that is going to allow us to move from this sphere of living into the next. It has to be 
by way of the church. And therefore, I have news for those that point finger at the church and try to look at all the negatives and etc. of the church. Of course, there are shortcomings. But however you want to put it, however anybody wants to turn it, we better come to the realization and the understanding that outside of the church of Jesus Christ, there is no other way, no other vehicle, no other medium by which we are going to be transported into the presence of Almighty God over on the other side. So those that bash the church, you better know what you're doing. We have to be careful. Those that are in the church that claim to be Christians, but when you listen to your speech and when you look at your writings and when you look at your comments, many who claim to be in the church are nothing but enemies of the church. And we better know who we are and where we stand. Because at the end of the day, as we look, we are going to see some things. And it is important that we understand, brothers and sisters, that if we know that this is the only way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How do we approach Jesus outside of the church? No way. So there's one way to God, one way to heaven, and it's by way of Jesus Christ. And if it is by way of Jesus Christ, it is by way of the church, the body, the vehicle that he has put in place to transport us to the home of the soul. If you have a problem with the church, you have a problem with Jesus Christ. You might say, we might say, I don't have a problem with the church. I have a problem with the people that make up the church. Well, let me correct you again. The church is the people. Absolutely so. The church is the people and therefore if you have a problem with the people, you do have a problem with the church. And if you have a problem with the church, you have a problem with the person himself who owns, who set up the church as the only medium for us to get to Almighty God from this side of life. So my advice to those that are in Christendom, to those that are in the church and you might feel that you have been hurt or we might feel that you, we, we didn't get the best of what we should, let's get back to God. Let's talk to the King. Let's talk to our Father in heaven and make things right. Because no matter how we spin it, no matter how we put it, at the end of the day, however you view the church, however you view the people that make up the body of Jesus Christ, if you view us negatively, if you view us as hypocrites, if you, it does not matter. At the end of the day, it is going to come back to one thing. No way under heaven we are going to move from this side to the next except by way of the church of Jesus Christ. No man will ever be raptured if he's not a part of the body of Christ. No man will ever be raptured if you are not a part of the church of the living God. So we need to get our perspectives clear. We need to have a long trajectory. We need to understand what we are in. We need to understand how we speak against God and against the church. Because if you speak against the church, if you speak against the people that constitute the church we need to understand who we are speaking against make no bones about it when the apostle paul was on his way to dismantle those believers and he was coming all the way over on the way on the damascus road coming to cause mayhem because he felt that it was a body that shouldn't be there he felt that it was illegitimate he felt that it had no true and just cause he felt that it was a body that was against and opposed to what was the established order and he was on his way to cause mayhem but jesus confronted him on his journey and said why why are you doing this against me 
he wasn't doing it against Jesus, literally. Jesus wasn't even here in the flesh. He was killing and causing mayhem in the church, in the body of Christ. And yet Jesus saying, why, Jesus said to the Apostle Paul, why persecutest thou me? I want to warn some wayward child of God. I want to give good advice to some child of God who believe that they have a good reason and the right to speak as they feel against this august body. Remember that it is the church of the living God, the ground and pillar of the truth. Remember that it is the body of Christ. And when Paul did it, he had to answer to Jesus himself when he was asked, Why persecutest thou me? And Paul was given some advice. And I would like to give advice to some people in the church right now. Yes, I would like to give advice to some people out of the church right now but who feel that the church ought to be persecuted because they have lost their way because of what a, a one man over here or a one man over there might have done. Be careful how we fight against, how we push against, how we persecute the church because we or you will be doing it against Jesus Christ himself. And he gave some solid words of advice to people like those. He said it is hard to kick against the pricks. So I would like to use Jesus' word to advise people today, this evening. It is hard to kick against the pricks. So let us understand that this church is here to stay. And as long as life is on this planet, and as long as the Lord holds himself and does not come, until such time when he comes, there will be a church. It will be a victorious church. It is a victorious church. It will be a church that moves from mountain tops and valleys. It is a church that moves from mountain tops and valleys. And so I want to encourage us, those that are in the church, those who feel a bit discouraged, those who feel that, you know, the church is being given a bad name and therefore I don't even want to associate myself with church because people are going to think that I'm weird and that I'm a part of a cult and that I, I am subjecting myself to a certain kind of leadership and I therefore, my status in life as a person in a, a certain profession and a certain a place in the society can't see or make anybody see me subjecting myself to being in a church and say that the Lord have control of my life. Let me encourage all of us. You are in a good place. You are in the right place. And even under the cloud of what is happening, people are still looking for genuine people of God, genuine, a genuine church. Because when the trials of life starts to kick even more as it will, and when the atmosphere changes even more as it will, and when the apocalypse, when the things written in Revelation that we already spoke about start to flow out even more, there is only one place, brothers and sisters, that they will come, that they will run to. And it will be to the church of the living God. And I want to say, hold your seat, hold your place in Zion. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You are in the church of Jesus Christ for such a time as this. Let no man steal your crown. Let no man cause you to turn back. Not no. And for those who are in the church and... You have taken vacation from church, vacation from the presence of God, vacation from doing the will of God. Let me give solid advice. Advice in love. Take some time, but no man is permitted to take vacation from God. 
No man is permitted to take time away from God. Take time away from everything else. Refresh and rejuvenate. Get ourselves in order. But we'll never get in order if we have taken time off from God. None of us are allowed to do that. We must maintain our walk. We must walk right and do our best to serve God. If we fall down today, get up back and continue the walk. This is the kind of perseverance. This is the kind of Christian that Jesus is going to give that crown of life happily to when the day comes and is in that space where he is giving those rewards out. Let no man steal your crown, saint of the Most High God. Let no man say words that will turn you, that will cause you to vacillate in your faith. You have been around too long now to make that happen. And so I want to encourage you again. And that's the basis upon which we are going to take some time and look at the seven churches in the book of Revelation so that we can understand what they went through, how the Lord addressed them, how the Lord dealt with them, how the Lord spoke to them to encourage them to go on. And we will find that although it was written to those people then, there are words in it that apply to Christians to this very day. And if the Lord could advise and commend and rebuke the churches back then. It is his church and he has that authority. And if he could do it back then, can I tell you, he can do it now and he is doing it now. I believe that these lessons, just for probably two or three weeks, is going to kind of have us to relook and rethink our position and who we are and how the church operates. And I pray that at the end of it all, we are admonished to the extent that we make the necessary adjustments, get ourselves together, and be sure. I want to say like the words of the songwriter, are you in the church triumphant? Are you in the Savior's bride? Come on over here and be baptized in the body and forevermore abide. That goes for all of us. I encourage us to, to, to keep our seat in Zion, to stay focused on Jesus and never lose sight of the fact that outside of the church, there is no other body, no other medium, no other institution no organization that can allow us or facilitate us into the presence of Almighty God. And therefore, this thing called the church, this body, this living organism called the church that many of us have taken for granted, it's time to put it in its rightful place and perspective and govern our lives according to what is required by the word of God, which is given to us in the church. For those people that say, I just want to have a relationship with God. I don't want to have anything to do with the church. Let me just put it to you straight. You can have no relationship with God outside of the church. He established the church for that purpose. Salvation comes only by way of what we know in the Bible, which was given through the church. It was the church that showed us the salvation plan. It was the church that gave us all the things. Paul's writing to the different bodies. Peter writing to the different assemblies. The different apostles writing. The apostle John writing the book of Revelation. They were all written to churches. And they are compiled for those that are in the body of Christ, there can be no relationship with God outside of the church. And I want us to be very clear in our minds. So for those people that say, I just want to have a relationship with God. I am not into the church thing. If you are unsaved, you need to get it straight. And for those who are saved and hold that position, 
Be for different reasons, whatever the reason, there are no justified reasons to hold such a position. The church is that body. The church is that vehicle. And I've said this three times now, and I'm saying it knowingly, but for emphasis. Yes? So let's get our perspective in the correct order. Outside of this body, if you are not interested in the church and you think the church has failed you and therefore you are going to just have your relationship with God and I'll stay home and thank God for the new arrangements because of COVID, oh man, it is temporary. And although it is novel for many, it serves a purpose and it will continue to serve a purpose. But then it cannot take the place of what the scripture tells us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And for those who decide that I'll never go back into a building to assemble with anybody, my church is my laptop. Ah, uh, look again. I'm going to talk about that at another time. But let's get into the seven churches of Revelation. Their impact, what, it, what is ha was happening there, and what is in it for the church of Jesus Christ today. I'm going to ask us to look at this screen. And as I said, I'm going to uh, present a PowerPoint to us and take us through some critical elements so that we understand leading up to the seven churches and then we are going to jump in and delve into the seven churches so that we can be clear as to what is at play. Brothers and sisters, just join the screen with me as we go through, amen, the seven churches. Now John the Apostle was commanded to write to seven churches in seven cities. Yes, right. He was commanded to write to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos, which they also call Pergamum, and Thyatira, Sardis and Philadelphia, and finally Laodicea. And these were seven churches that literally existed back there. No doubt there were other churches that were there. And the question is, why is it that only seven churches uh, were chosen. There are differing reasons as to that, but there's one of the reasons given where because the churches were in particular districts, in particular cities that they call postal districts in the Roman province of Asia, they were sent to those churches. When those letters got there, they were able to move from Ephesus and then on to Smyrna and then on to Pergamos and then on to Thyatira. These were all postal districts in that particular Roman province of Asia. And when we talk about Asia and Asia Minor, we are not talking about the Asia as we know it today where the Chinese and the Japanese are. We are talking about Asia Minor. It was a Roman province. The Romans were in charge. They were the world power at the time. And so they held sway over a large part of the, the world, the then known world. And they had different provinces right around the world. So Asia Minor was a Roman province. And what is called Asia, according to Revelation, is what we know today as the country of Turkey. So all these seven churches that we just mentioned were a part of uh, Asia Minor, the province, and they were a part of what we now know as modern-day Turkey. So Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira, all seven of those were postal districts. And it is therefore possible that because you could send the letter there, then they went around to all of these postal districts. And from there, they would have gone on to other churches that no doubt would have been over there in Asia, that Roman province. So that is one reason why it would have possibly been seven churches because these seven cities where these churches were located are postal districts. And so 
to make sure that it got over there, they were sent to all of these postal districts, and from there, they were dispersed and sent to the other churches. There is also the other reason. Uh, the Bible talks about um, the number seven quite often, and we will recognize that, you know, seven in biblical numerology represents uh, perfection it represents completeness and these letters yes along with all the book of revelation was written to the complete church so although seven was highlighted and seven was picked out seven because it represents completeness could simply mean that the lord used these seven churches as a kind of representative they are representation of the complete church, of all the churches that might have been there, and these seven represented them. What happened in these seven churches, no doubt, would have been happening to different extent in the other churches. So by pulling these seven, you still capture what was happening in other places, and these seven completed uh, those total other churches. All right, so it represents completeness, and therefore these seven easily would be a representative of all the other churches. So we find that the Lord sent to these seven churches, and he was going to use them to bring out a message that will, would be impacting on those seven churches and on the others that would have heard the messages that were there. Because no doubt, whatever letters reached these seven would over time reach to the other. But what was contained in terms of the message to the seven was sufficient to address the issues that was prevailing wherever the churches were over there in Asia Minor. And so, as we look at studying the seven churches in Revelation, there is a particular approach that we will have to take if we are going to come to a proper understanding of what is at play. Those that study the churches in the different arena are in agreement Basically, with three main perspectives, three main views, three main methods of analyzing and studying the seven churches. And in essence, there are three prevailing concepts, three prevailing views that is recognized, that is accepted in studying and in coming to understanding of these seven churches. There is what is called the historical view. Then there is also, secondly, the representative view. And finally, there is what is called the prophetic view. Uh, generally, most biblical scholars accept the first two without any argument, any squabble. There are those who have their hang-ups or have second thoughts about the third one which is called the prophetic view but we are going to go into it because personally i believe it is significant or i believe it can be accepted in terms of what it has to offer it matches it mirrors so much the things that happened in church history and we will take the time out and we will examine it together and we will see what we can pull from it but essentially, three main views, the historical view or the historical perspective, the representative view or the prophetic view. And these are the three common views out there in analyzing and understanding the seven churches of Revelation. Now let us take the first one, the historical view. Here we find that this view of the seven churches represents churches that literally existed 
in the Roman province of Asia Minor during the first century. Uh, it is important to understand that this particular understanding, this particular view, this particular thought is that these seven churches were real churches. They were literal churches. They existed. And we know that this is a fact. One of the churches that were there, which is the church of Ephesus, it was the apostle Paul himself who started that, 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 that church. As we went through the book of Acts, uh, recently we read through in our Bible study, Bible reading each night, and we ran through the book of Acts. And you remember Paul was on a journey one time, one time. And as he passed through Ephesus. It is the same Ephesus that we made mention of earlier on. Uh, one of the seven churches. It is this same Ephesus. Paul was in this particular city for a couple of years. And it, while he was going on his way going through Ephesus. He saw some who had heard and had believed but up to that point, they had not yet even been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And it is Paul that directed them and showed them the way. And coming out of that experience, established the church at Ephesus. So we know that Ephesus was a real, literal, physical church in the Roman province of Asia Minor at that time. And if Ephesus was one of the churches, then so then would be Smyrna. And so there would be the others. They were real, existing, literal churches that were around in the first century. And so the historical view presents that these churches were literal, they were real, and letters were sent to them directly to address some things that were happening in these seven churches. But of course, these seven churches reflected what might have been happening in the others. But seven being God's perfect number, as we said, and represents completeness, completeness, they were all presented via these seven churches. So that was the historical view. Now we are looking at the representative view. And in this view, we find that the seven churches, though they might have existed back there in the first century, and the letters were written directly to them, the representative view is saying to us that the years would have passed, but the messages that were written to them can be applied to our own walk and represents our state, our current status, our current, current walk with the Lord Jesus. In other words, although the things that were written to the churches then were written to them and had a meaning for them based on the historical view, the representative view is saying that while that is so, it also has meaning for those that are in the church today and our present state and our walk with Jesus can be assessed based on the things that were written to those churches. So that some of the things that were said to the church at Ephesus, as we go down, we will look at it. We are going to find that in our walk today, some of those same things are going to be said to some of us. Because some of us would have had the same experience that some of the churches back there had. It might be different in one church, but you might find it manifesting itself in another church. So you might be full of love today, brotherly love, but at the same time, there is something else. You have the, 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 the works of the Nicolaitans, which you hold today. And so the point is, in this representative view, it reflects the state, the, our current walk with the Lord, and therefore the things that were said to them back there that they had to learn, they are being, say, they are being said to us today, and therefore we must learn. And it is very important. And then the third view, which is the prophetic view, 
here we find the view that the seven churches represents the spiritual history of the church from John's day right down to this very day. And that is a fact. So that we are saying that all that is happening in this prophetic view is that these seven churches represent seven period in church history from the first century church where these seven were from that time right down to where we are we have passed through a couple hundred years and what the prophetic view is putting forth is that these seven churches represent throughout this entire period from the first century to this 21st century that we are in it represents seven distinct and separate church period, prophetic period, that that prophecy in Revelations chapter 2 and verse, and chapter 3, sorry, all the ages from that first century to this 21st century, the prophetic view is saying that these seven churches represent seven periods over time so that there was one period that represents what the church of Ephesus was going that church that had lost their first love then there's another period that represents a period of persecution which is exactly what the church at Smyrna had experienced by virtue of the emperors that were persecuting the church and there was a particular point in time a particular period for about a couple uh, for, 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 for a couple hundred years when the church was constantly being persecuted and it was saying that the, the Smyrna church represented that particular point in church history when the church was being persecuted. Then there was another period in church history when the church had stopped being persecuted and they were embraced and that represents the period from AD 325 when Constantine came up and going down the church was no longer persecuted but the church was embraced and the church was the place to be and all of a sudden a lot of people of the state and society people wanted to be a part of the church and so this represented another period of the church age and yet in church from Re Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 it represents the church of Pergamos which was believed to have come out of the Smyrna period when the church was persecuted and come into a period where the church was accepted. And so there are significant points that can be made in support of the prophetic view, but we will deal with it afterwards. We will treat with it at the end, but let us, for the time being, treat with uh, the first two, which is accepted by all, and then towards the end of the presentation, when we reach there, we will look at the prophetic view and go through church history and see if we can pick up the different church period over time up to this present day that you and I are in. So these essentially are the three prevailing views that are out there as we seek to study the seven churches in Revelation. So let us move over now and we are going to give an introduction and then take our time and go into the, the seven churches. The salutation to the angel of each churches contains a reference to some characteristic of the glorified Christ. And that is, that is very, very, very significant. Um, I want us to take a quick look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, uh, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. There is a, there is a greeting, but notice, that unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. And it is very significant because as we go to 
all the churches. If we go down to verse 8 of Revelation chapter 2, when he moves from the church of Ephesus and he goes over to the church of Smyrna. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things say the first and the last which was dead and is alive forevermore. All the messages was sent, all the letters were sent to the angels and they, of the seven churches and they all, in terms of the salutation, you look at it, the salutation to the angel of each church contains a reference to some characteristics of the glorified Jesus Christ. And we just made mention of it. Uh, unto the angel of the church of Smyrna, these things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Yet when we read the first church, which was Ephesus, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. There is something that strikes us, brothers and sisters. There is something that jumps out at us. Apart from the salutation to the angel of each church, to every one of the church is a particular characteristic of Jesus that is mentioned. Whether it is the first and the last, or he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, there is something about his character that is revealed to each of the seven churches. A different aspect of his character is related to each of the church. And that is very significant because he might just use the fact that I am the first and the last to deal with a situation in that particular church where people are thinking that he is not sufficient to address a particular need or situation in their local assembly or in their local um, situation. And in dealing with that particular church, he makes reference to the fact that I am the first and the last. And he has his reason for saying that. Because he wants them to know that whatever is happening to you, I am sufficient. I am the first. I am the last. And he goes on to give other things about himself to address, no doubt, some particular situation or circumstance that they were confronted with. I would like us to understand, brothers and sisters, it does not matter what you face in your walk with God in the church today. It might be something relating to your reaching out after him and your somehow not getting an answer for, from him as it relates to your situation, whether at work or at home or wherever. He has something about him that when he presents himself, he will present present that particular character of himself that can minister and will minister to that particular situation that you confront as an individual or that is confronted as a church in general. And whatever the church is going through, whatever the need in any church is, the glorified risen Christ has things about him that will meet and that will address any one of those need, those circumstances that may come your way in your personal walk as a child of God or in your local assembly, wherever that assembly is. Now, there's a second point here I, I made, I alluded to it somewhat just now. He wrote while he wanted his letter, while he wanted the revelation, while he wanted the information to go to the church. Notice who he addressed the letters to. The angels of the churches. Some folks are a little confused as to who the angels are. I would like for us to understand 
that there is a particular Greek word, angelos, that is used in the scripture. And that original Greek word simply means messenger or leader or pastor. So that the angels of the churches are the local pastors or leaders of each of the seven churches. To every one of them, he sent the letter. Though he wanted the message to get to the church, notice, he sent the letter to the angel of the, of the seven churches, to the pastors of the seven churches, to the leaders or the elders of the seven churches, the person who was in charge of the church, he addressed the letter to them. It is showing that in the church and in how the church function, there is order. To the folks that say, I don't need to hear from a pastor or a, or a leader about anything. I don't need any teachings from a pastor. I will go and do things on my own. It is significant that in the New Testament, in the church of the living God, Jesus now is going to address the church. And he addresses it by way of the angel or the pastor of the church. I want us to understand the order. I want us to understand that, yes, God, we can go and pray to God. Pastors can't pray on your behalf, and you don't pray. All of us have a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God. And this is not taking away that relationship. All of us, God speak to on matters. This is not taking away God relating to you or as an individual, young Christian, or elderly saint. This is not taking that away. This is simply saying that there are some things that God is going to do as it relates to his body. That because the church belongs to him. And he is the one that is going to lead it in a particular direction. Or take it through a particular storm. Or take it through a particular crisis. Or he is going to take them to a particular place. And when God is setting up to do a particular thing with a particular church. His church that he owns, he does it because he's a God of order. Let everything be done decently and in order. He deals with the matter and he always go by way of the angel of the church, of the leader of the church. And as he does that and lead it into a particular direction, of course the saints under God are going to be following the Lord, following the leadership. But then that doesn't take away our personal responsibility and our personal relationship. But there is no way that somebody can say, I, I will never, I don't need to talk to or, or converse with or relate to or take teaching from a pastor or a minister or the, the elder for the church. I don't need to take that. I only go to the Lord. I only deal with the Lord. That is not the order that God sets up. So we do have our personal relationships and we must have our personal relationships. But we must also understand the role that God has for the person who he calls the angel or the pastor of the church. And so this is made clear as the apostle penned what the Lord told him. And then notice when I made the point a short while ago that the angels by virtue of the Greek word um, angel it literally means messenger. When we look at Revelation um, chapter Revelation chapter number two and verse ten, it, it is very significant. It said, "Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer." And he's talking to you know the, 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 the church. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that he may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou fearful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Be thou faithful unto death. It couldn't be angels as in heavenly beings that he was speaking to. Because angels do not die. The angel he was talking here are the angels, the minister, the pastor of the church. And he's telling the pastor that look here as you go through, be faithful unto death. Angels do not die. So this angel that we are reading about, that we are looking at here, is not speaking to the angelic beings up there, but just the messenger, the leader of the church. And it is important in our introduction that we 
are clear on that. Now, as we go through the letters to the seven churches, we notice that there, there is a, a, a common structure in all of them. All the letters tend to follow a certain pattern. But then even as it goes through, even as we go through and we look at the pattern, we are seeing some things here. One, we see that they, they are all addressed uh, to a particular church. So there is an address. We see for all of them, there is a description, a particular description for a particular church of a particular characteristic of Jesus. So it might be, I am the one with the eyes that burn like fire. I am the one, I am the first and the last. I am he that was dead, but I'm, I'm alive forevermore. It, it gives a description of Jesus. And each of the seven church have a different description of who Jesus is. And that's very significant. They know there, there is a, a word of commendation. And then there, fourthly, there is a word of rebuke. Although there are about two of the church that got no commendation in it at all. And there were two that had no criticism. But just in a general sense, they just following when you read, you get the sense that there is a word of commendation because, you know, the, 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 the great majority either got a word of commendation or on the opposite side, they got a word of rebuke based on the condition of the church. Then there is a command from Jesus, a general uh, a command from Jesus to the church. And after that, there is a general exhortation. And it ends finally with a promise of reward. This is the basic structure in terms of the outline to every one of the seven churches. And I want us to take the time and to just let this digest in. Because as you go through each of them, you're going to see this kind of outline with each of the church. So we move over to the first church, to the church of Ephesus, and I'd like us to turn together. I'd bring it up on the screen because uh, I want us to read and I want us to be in this together. Amen. Revelation chapter number two, and we are dealing with now the first church. And Revelation chapter two, verses one to seven, speaks to that unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Right. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars. And hast borne and hast patience. And for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. And there is seen going through and giving them words of commendation. So we see the outline coming alive as we look into those um, parts of the first section of the verses. And we see him commending them. We see him talking a little bit about some characteristic of himself. And we see him commending them and all. But here now we come across to some serious further words of Jesus Christ addressing this church, who he said so many good things about, nevertheless, he said, I have somewhat against thee. Nevertheless, I have something against you because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou hast fallen and repent and do the first works. You have lost your first love. You have lost the fervor. That you once had. And there's a problem that I have with that. And hear what I'm saying to you. Repent and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly. And will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Except thou repent. But then he continue on. But this thou hast. That thou hatest the deed of the Nicolaitans. Which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And then he goes on. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the 
tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, having read the scripture, let us look at a little history of Ephesus. The first letter is addressed to the church in Ephesus. And it is important to give a, a history. Because why that history comes in very important, it shows us the atmosphere. It shows us the environment in which the church was functioning. And it is going to be the same thing happening today. We are going to find that the church functions in different environments. Notice that many of the churches that, that are in Jamaica, they tend to be fiery and full of zeal and want to go and out and, and, and go house to house and knock at people's gate and carry out evangelistic work. But if we take a look at another uh, place, for example, let us look over in some parts of Canada or, or some parts of the United States or over in Europe. The very time that we are here in Jamaica, for example, right now, knocking house to house, having evangelistic service, and I, I'm just talking outside of the COVID era, doing the work of ministry, fervent in doing that. At that same moment, if you go into Belgium, there may be an apostolic church there. Or if you just come closer home to the United States or Canada, you would see churches that claim to be apostolic and they preach the word and they preach a certain doctrine and they, they do the things that we do. But then there is the absence of that zeal. There is the absence of that fervor. They don't go out. They don't want to do that. They are not even permitted in some jurisdictions from going to knock on people's gate. And so we find that it is important to understand some things about the background. And it is when we get the history, then we see what is happening round about us, what is happening round about, in this case, the church at Ephesus, and we see the environment, the climate in which the church was functioning. And we are going to show you why that is so important. So let us have a little historical peep at the church at Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was a crossroad uh, of civilization at the time, a city of great political importance, right? It was a commercial center and it was a religious center. At that time, we know, we said it earlier on, that the, the, the dominant world power was the Romans and every other country that was under their jurisdiction, under their colonial reach, they were like provinces. But there was something about Ephesus. Ephesus had a lot of autonomy. Ephesus had a lot of uh, 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 freedoms that even others uh, that were within the Roman Empire did not have. And so it was a commercial center. It was a religious center. It had great political importance. And so they were autonomous. They were free. Uh, they, it was a strong source of income. Yes, that city had a, a great temple uh, dedicated to Diana, the god of fertility or the goddess of fertility. Whole lot of things were happening here. Earlier on, I made mention that in Acts chapter 19, uh, this, Ephes this Ephesian church was literally planted or put together by the apostle Paul. And that was, that was uh, said earlier on. He took his time and he went through and that church was planted there. Uh, in, in Acts chapter, not Acts, but in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, and in Acts chapter 18, 24 to 28, we find that the, Timothy was one of the persons that came down to Ephesus to minister, right? Um, we, 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 we recognize, therefore, that the Apostle Paul was there. We recognize, therefore, that Timothy was there. We recognize that Aquila and Priscilla was there. So this particular city, yes, was 
a very significant part of the cities around and the church that was in Ephesus was significant. So here it was operating as a significant church but operating in an environment where there was a lot of wealth, where it was a political stronghold, then it was also a religious stronghold. So not only religious stronghold because the church was here, but watch, it was where the temple of the goddess Diana, the fertility god was. They were open to all kind of sexual immorality in this little Ephesian city. So it, it had political clout, it had money, it had freedom, and it was a place of idol worship. And the idol worship allows and facilitated, remember now, you know, the goddess of fertility. When you talk about fertility goddess, you know, it's not just talking about fertility in terms of the land. It is talking about fertility in terms of um, conception. And for conception to take place, and lots of conception, because there were many who were not fertile. They were engaged and were unable to produce offspring. But the goddess of fertility, so everybody had their little demi mini god. You could go and buy an idol of the fertility goddess and carry it home. And at times you would go to the temple and worship Diana. No, what most folks don't know is that in the worship of Diana, the goddess of fertility, there were some rituals that folks had to go through and participate in. And these rituals included... Um, immoral acts, orgies, sexual orgies. And this is where a lot of folks get that practice from, from over there in that little city, as small as it was. But it was one of those areas that was rife with sexual immorality that was pervasive in that city called Ephesus. So here, let, just for summary a couple of things with Ephesus. It had a strong political influence. Yes, it was a crossroad to civilization. It was a city of great political influence. I know politics strong. And if you have your political connections, you can get a lot of things done. You can get to places. You can get into certain kind of business. And so if you are going to be anybody of sorts, anybody of influence, your political ties had to be strong. And then in addition to the crossroads to civilization, or crossroad of civilization, in addition to that and the political importance and influence, there was a lot of commerce. Business was booming. Money was being made. But it was also a religious center. So a lot of things was happening for that little city. And then the, the worship of, of, of Diana was rife. And the, that fertility goddess, by virtue of what was involved in that form of idol worship, they continue to carry on immoral acts, sexual orgies, and all those kind of things. However... In the midst of it all, there was the church of Ephesus. The church of Jesus Christ was there, planted in the midst of all of the politics and all of the commerce and all of the, <coughs> pardon me, all of the religious happenings. There was a church of Jesus Christ in the midst of them. And it was significant that Jesus wrote to them and made the points that he made to them. So, Jesus himself now, <coughs> pardon me, unto the angel of the church, of Ephesus right. This is now Jesus describing himself to them 
in the midst of all that was happening, Jesus is now writing to them, describing himself to them. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And Jesus was saying, look here, I hold the seven stars. And you know the seven stars, who they are. And he walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So brothers and sisters, even while all of these things might be happening in the environment and there's a strong political influence there and a strong religious idol influence there and a strong uh, commercial influence there and uh, it is the crossroad and every type of different background of people are coming in and going out. Here it was that the church was there and Jesus was saying, I am he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. I encourage pastors. I encourage ministers. I encourage us all. He also walk in the midst of the seven golden lampstand, which is the seven churches. Look here. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are located as a body of Christ. If you are there and you are fervent and you are holding on to God, God holds us in his hands and he walks up and down in the midst of the church. I want us to never lose sight of that. It doesn't matter that the temple of the goddess Diana was there in Ephesus and they were carrying out sexual immorality in that place and the people was, the, the place was, it was a pervasive, immoral society. Orgies and all. People going in with other people's wives. Going into the temple. And a part of the ritual was to consummate sexual activity right there in that temple. And that was what was going on right around the city of Ephesus. And that in addition to the political hustling. That in addition to the business dealing that all that was on people's mind was making money, making money, making money. And so Jesus now, with the church that was there, pointed to the church and said something to them. And that was very important. The first thing Jesus said to this church at Corinth was that I know your works. Jesus looked at Ephesus and knew the condition of Ephesus. It was no mystery to him. No matter how folks are in the church and try to hide their sins and try to hide the corrupt practices and no matter how a congregation might try to put some things under the carpet and try to hide it from outsiders or individual sins, try to hide it from the local pastor, let me tell us all, it cannot be hidden from the Lord Jesus Christ. He said it then and he would say it today to both individuals and to congregations i know your works jesus knows it and i want us to understand that hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13 tells us neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. He knows your works. He knows your works. There's the other scripture in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. 
So brothers and sisters, the background, the background to Ephesus was one that it was polluted with religious idolatry. It had all the political hustlings going around. It had all the business deals taking place. It was the crossroad where all kind of people come in and bring in their different beliefs and philosophies. And all of that was a mixing, melting pot in Ephesus. But the church was there. And in the midst of that condition, in the midst of that society, the church was planted. And did you know that there to that church, Jesus was saying, I want you to live a certain way. I want you to maintain a certain lifestyle. I want you to order your steps irrespective of what is happening in that Ephesian society. He knows their works. He knows their labor. He knows their patience. And then he went on and he knows that they cannot bear those who are evil. He knows that they have tried them would say that they are apostles. Because guess what was happening now? People were coming in to the church. And they were infiltrating and presenting themselves as being saved and as being great and, and, and wanted to be leaders and wanted to now tell the Ephesian church how they ought to operate and nothing is wrong with this and nothing is wrong with that and you can do this and you can do that. But then the Ephesian church uh, tried them and I'm glad for that. They knew the word. They knew, and, and brothers and sisters, I am saying to us in the church of this 21st century, it is important. Jesus knew their works. He knew their labor. He knew their patience. He knew the fact that they cannot bear those who are evil. In other words, they don't put up with foolishness. And I want, I want this church to be a church like that. That their works are important. Their labor is important. Their patience is important. They, they don't put up with slackness and foolishness. And when folks within the church are introducing slackness and things that are evil, instead of adopting it and just sitting down and allowing others to present things to you that is foreign to you, I want us to have this particular trait of the Ephesian church where they don't bear those who are evil, but they see something that is wrong and they expose it. It does not matter who. And this Ephesian church had that. And they tried them that say that they are apostles and are not. And I found them to be liars. It was the apostle Paul in Acts 28 and verse 20. You know, when he was warned in the same Ephesians that after my departure, they are going to, be co they are going to come in. Wolves, take heed therefore unto yourselves. This was Paul writing to them, you know. And to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And so this Ephesian church, they knew that some of these things that they were hearing were a lie. And thank God they didn't put up with it. And they exposed the lie. And they don't suffer those that come up with evil things trying to introduce it into the church. They opposed it. They saw through it. And all that we would take this trait of the Ephesian church where we stand up for the things that we know are right, the things that have been taught from the word of God, the things that were clearly outlined, that we stand up for it. And don't make anybody, no matter who, introduce these sexually immoral things and, and things that are unacceptable as a child of God and come to you to say nothing is wrong with it and, and it can be done. Others are doing it. We know the simple things that made up this 
beautiful apostolic movement. And we have gone through them and we have suffered with all of us with them. And we have presented them. And we are not going to remove the ancient landmarks. Mark, there are some things that we hold up that we call standards that are man-made and they can be adjusted. And I'm not talking about that. But there are some fundamental tenets of this beautiful truth. And we must be cheerful that we maintain sound doctrine and we maintain the beauty of holiness and we maintain modesty as we move into holiness and keep ourselves pure before God. Do not let others whether from outside or within, try to lead you along a certain sideline. Be like the Ephesians and resist those that are evil and stand up for what you're right. So here, the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew what was in the Ephesian church, he knew what was happening to them. He had some words of commendation for them now. So here he said that they have perse per persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So he is commending them. He knew some things about them and we listed those things. And now based on what he knows about them, he's commended them. He's commending them. For my name's sake, you have not become weary. And there is something that you have that I, that, that I appreciate about you. You hear the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. That's very significant. What are the deeds of the Nicolaitans? Now, who was Nicholas? Nicolaitans are those that followed a particular guy coming from way back. His name was Nicholas. And this is, history has it. And I'm going off what the history has presented. So the Nicolaitans were some followers of uh, the originator, some Gnostic movement, a man by the name of Nicholas. It is believed that it is the same Nicholas in Acts chapter 6 verse 5, who was a convert to Christianity in Acts 6 verse 5, yes? And the, the root word for the meaning of that name, it means conqueror or destroyer. And you would have heard about old Saint Nick, Nicholas, and we know that that relates to Satan himself. But the Greek root meaning of the word is destroyer. And so some scholars literally believe it is the same convert, as I said a while ago in Acts 6, that was converted to Christianity. Now what was the practices of those that consider that call themselves the Nicolaitans? One, and incidentally, their practices, as you go into Revelation 2, we're going to see it with one, the other church, Revelation 2, 14 and 15. You're going to notice that the, the, work, the deeds of the Nicolaitans and the deeds of Balaam do, are linked together, very similar. And so we are going to understand that it is something, as Jesus said, whose works I also hate. What are the works of the Nicolaitans? One. They push idol worship, but in a subtle way. These are folks that says nothing is wrong. Men were made a certain way. Women were made a certain way. And even if we are Christians, we are still man and woman that God made. It is natural and normal for sexual activities to take place because we are men and we were built with a natural instinct and urge to have sexual intercourse and to procreate and ladies were built to receive men this is how we were built and so they they, they made a philosophy around our 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 humanity our masculinity and femininity and said it is normal and biological and therefore we ought not to be chastised for doing what we are by nature made to do and they brought this into the church and used this to seduce men and women into sexual immorality and so even in the ephesian churches church there was that that was creeping in and they hated it and they fought against it. And that particular 
form of idolatry with a subtle introduction of sexual immorality. The church hated it and Jesus said, I also hate it. And if in the church of Jesus Christ today, there is that move to normalize sex outside of marriage, brothers and sisters, it is wrong. And we hit against it in the most vehement way in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You are going to be found out and you are going to be exposed. You better turn away. Jesus said, I hate it. And let me tell you, Jesus is not going to sit down with something that he hates and allow it to go on and on. He has given people the space to repent. And if we don't, it is just a matter of time. We talk against it. We preach against it. We are going to allow God to come in and to make his clean sweep. And brothers and sisters, if God make the sweep, believe me, we do want it to happen that way. But for those who continue to hear and continue not to move, make the move to stop, we will feel and we will realize then that God is a consuming fire. The God whom we, with whom we have to deal is a consuming fire. So after Jesus gave them their commendation and told them that I see this about you and I, the, the, you, you, you hate the words of the Nicolaitan which I also hate and he commended them for resisting those things in the church. He nevertheless had a rebuke so the same Jesus who commend is the same Jesus who will rebuke. The same Jesus who pat you on the shoulder is the same Jesus that can give it to you in a real solid, serious way. His words of commendation to them. I know your works and your labor and your patience. And you cannot bear those that are evil. And you are against those. That are the Nicolaitans. You hate the deeds of them. And he's commending them. And you have persevered. And have labored for my name's sake. And have not become weary. My God, what words of commendation. But yet the same Jesus come around now. And say, I have somewhat against you. You have left your first love. Despite all the good in the Ephesian church. There was something that was seriously wrong. Notice, you know, they, they, they were doing all kinds of activities. And Jesus commended them. So it's not even like they were doing it in self and in the flesh, you know. They were doing it and were commended for it because nothing is wrong in doing good works. The Bible tells us that you were saved unto good works. So we might not have been saved by good works, but now having been saved, we are saved unto good works. So that there's nothing wrong with what they were doing. It was good of them to have resisted the deeds of the Nicolaitans. It was good of them to have done the work for Jesus and not become weary. And Jesus saw it and he acknowledged it and he commended them. But in spite of that, Jesus is not going to be satisfied with the fact that we do a few things right and see something seriously wrong and don't rebuke us. So he's saying, with all that you were doing, and I commend you for it, there is a problem. You have left your first love. And so despite all the good, something is absolutely wrong. Brothers and sisters, I am saying this to us. Yes, we have to do what we must for the kingdom's sake. Yes, we have to do, and nothing is wrong with working for the king. We must work for Jesus till the shadows fall. Give to him our all in the dewy evening when the, where the rivers meet. Do what we have to do. Work where we must. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. It doesn't 
all add up. If we are big on activities, if we are well involved, our evangelistic ma uh, machinery is well oiled, big on the activities, do a lot of works, it is good, but it makes no sense that we are huge on our works, brothers and sisters, and we are lacking in love. Jesus says, I have somewhat against you. I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. It makes no sense. I want to admonish, I want to admonish every one of us, every child of God. I want to rivet it in our minds. We can do all that must be done as it relates to evangelism. We can do all what has to be done as it relates to getting things together and in order. And we must do those things. We see Jesus commending them. They are commendable. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, if we are lacking in love, then all of those things will become not. Love must prevail. Love must pervade. The, the atmosphere must be saturated with love. And if we have lost our love, then it makes no sense. What sense does it make? And this seemed to come out strongly in what Jesus was saying because his rebuke to them was the fact that they have left their first love. Their fervor, the zeal, the desire for him that drove them. Some people are actually doing the works without the love. And so their task is now manual. And we must be careful, brothers and sisters, in the church of Jesus Christ, that we are not doing the thing that we are doing out of mere mechanical movements. We cannot do the thing simply because we are asked. There has to be a love first and foremost for the Jesus that died for us. There has to be a love for people, the saints, the brethren within the church. And there has to be a love for souls. Don't just do the things because you're asked to do them in as much as they have to be done. Don't just do the things because we look around and see that there is a need to teach a Sunday school class or to minister over there in that particular era or to minister over there in that particular era. Let us get back to the first love that we have moved away from. You have left your first love. So it's not like the love was lost and we don't know what happened to it. You know. We walk away. We stop being fervent in prayer. Is we stop reading the word. Is we move away from the fellowship and the communion that was there. We walk away from that. And once we walk away from the presence of God. Once we walk away from doing the things that keep relationship together. Brothers and sisters, we would have walked away from our first love. The vibrancy, the passion. The, 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 the ecstasy of our prayer and our fasting and our relationship with God. Sometimes we don't want to leave. And a half hour turn to one hour and one hour turn to two hours and two turn to three in the presence of God. You remember those days? You remember you don't want to get up from off your knees. You don't want to leave from in the presence of God. Even if it's just to sit down on the ground or kneel on your knees and just hang over that bed. You just don't want to move. What has happened now? We have not lost it. It don't last. It is right there still. 
but we have walked away from our first love, which is the relationship with Jesus that caused that burning desire that propelled us to do the works that are right and to teach that Sunday school class and to exhort in the assembly and to sing on the choir and then on the praise team or wherever we sing. That love that propelled us to do it no matter what nobody say. That love that push us and we not become weary. That is what we have left. And Jesus is using that as the rebuke to the church of Ephesus. And this is how that particular view that causes us to apply what happened then in our life today. We can look and see what happened in Ephesus and determine if that is happening in us, in this church in our lives today. I want us to understand that Jesus having identified what the issue was and gave them that strong re rebuke, he told them to know, listen, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. What was the first works? What was those foundational things brothers and sisters that kept us vibrant and burning with love and desire let's get back to prayer let's get back to fasting let's get back to the word let's get back to coupling it together let's get back to singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in our hearts as to, to the lord let's get back to those days when we don't allow our peers to pressure us to do wrong, let's get back to the first love that we have walked away from. And this is what Jesus was saying. Remember from where thou hast fallen? Repent. Do the first works. The foundational things. Get back to basics. And let's build up that red, hot, burning love and desire for Jesus Christ and the things of God and watch and see how like the church of Ephesus we are going to come around if you don't you're not hurting anybody you're hurting your own self because Jesus said or else in other words if you don't repent and go back and do the first work as I am telling you to do Jesus talking he said, if you don't do that, listen, it's simple. I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. And this is Jesus himself speaking. I'm going to be closing now, but I, let us just understand that Jesus loves the church. Jesus, the great God Almighty, who died on the cross and did what he had to do, loves this church. It is his church. And he's the one that after giving us the commendation, gave us the rebuke by showing us what the problem is, give us the solution, and then said, don't do it and say, I, Jesus, will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. And in closing, he tells them, if you overcome, if you overcome, I will allow you to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The fact that he says to them that overcome, it is simply suggesting that we all have the capacity to overcome. Why do I say that? Listen to what the final exhortation of Jesus is. A general e exhortation as we close. 
he said, he who hath an ear, brothers and sisters, he who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This, qual this actually qualifies everyone or everyone that will hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We must hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, not just the Ephesian church, but to the churches. That includes you and I. He spoke in those letters to them, that church at Ephesus, and that same letter and what we have gone through is speaking to you and I today. I stop here. Let us take seriously what we have just said because it is a serious matter. And Jesus made no bones to say he will come quickly and remove our lampstands. The church is not a place to mess around. The church is not a place to joke around. If you feel you don't want to go any further, don't have one foot in and one foot out and become lukewarm. He will spew you out of his mouth. Make up your minds. And my strong advice to all of us is to make up our minds to serve him. But if you make up your mind to leave, up to you. But to have one foot in and one foot out, to be serving Jesus and to be serving Satan, you're doing yourself a disservice. Your friends might not tell you. They're telling you you're all right. They're liars. They're telling you you're good, you're happy, you're not happy, you're dying. Let me tell you, because I love you. They don't love you. They pretend to love you. But I'm telling you, based on the word of God, based on what we just read, he will come. And remove your lamps and out of his place. They are not telling you that. They are telling you to live in sin and, and enjoy yourself. How must you enjoy yourself in sin? Don't listen to them. Anywhere you are in Jamaica, America, Canada, wherever you are. Don't listen to people like those even if they say that they are Christians. They are not. And they don't mean you good. But even to those that give that kind of bad advice, I am saying to you. And even to those that are taking that advice, I am saying to you. And to all that are wavering, I am saying to us. Because if nobody else don't tell you, I have to tell you. And I'm saying it in love. Choose Jesus. Follow his words. Heed his, his warnings that we have just examined. And make a decision to be an overcomer. So that you can eat and drink from the fountain of living water and eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. God bless you in Jesus' name. Father, we come before your presence right now and we say thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for what you have allowed us to glean from the simple words this evening. We thank you for the ability to teach. I pray for the ears and the hearts of the people of God, that we will hear and that we will receive the word tonight. Thank you for allowing us to go through this first church in Bible study this evening. I pray, God, that you will spare our lives and open the door again, if it is your will, so that we can get back to move to the other churches and to see how you dealt with the churches then and therefore how you are dealing with us today. Let your perfect will be done. We give you thanks. We glorify you, great God, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you for being a part of Bible study. I want us to take the time, go through slowly and get this into our system. It is important. It is a matter of life and death. And I charge and challenge every one of you saints, let us do the right and be on the firing line. God bless you. God's willing. Next week, same time, same place. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.